welcome to the Empower Performance for Curlers podcast. This is a monthly segment that I have been doing for the past three months is the third month and I'll be doing continually throughout the off season. And the idea is that I'll be collecting little questions and answers that people send my way. And maybe it's by email, maybe it's by that I have an anonymous form that I add into the show notes, or it's through Instagram because you know, once in a while I'll put out a little Q&A, what do you want me to answer? But the purpose is that lets me answer some quick questions in a really quick fashion. And we're going to finish with a a case study. So the first month in January, we focused, I believe, on the hips. We had a uh, someone, I based it off of someone that I I was working on in person. The second month, we had a submission of a case study, which is a lot of fun because we had some videos that we could analyze. And I basically walk you through what I might do with that person based off of their goals, their video, and give you a little outline. So if you're like, I have something that I'd love you to help me with, and I kind of want to do it for free, and I'm brave enough to send in some video analysis that's going to obviously end up on YouTube, then uh, please do so uh, through email or through the Q&A form. Now, recognize that I am filming this. So I've got the YouTube, uh, I've got this happening on YouTube. So thank you if you're joining and watching me. And also this is available through podcasts. So obviously with podcasts, you can't see me, but both the show notes and the description of the YouTube link is going to provide you with all the resources that you need, anything that I kind of mention, And then of course the YouTube lets you kind of see me moving. So feel free. I know I talk fast, but you could do this on 1.5 speed to just zip your way through it. So remember, these are really quick answers. So obviously we could dive in more and Most of the questions I get asked are very general. So I'm answering them in a very general way. It's very hard for me to be specific without specifics. And I don't think it's really fair either. Like really what we're looking at is some general questions and some general question and answers. So bunch of questions. I took a bunch from a Q and A post from Instagram. And then I realized that people actually had filled in the anonymous. So I had a bunch to add at the end. So I'll try to be nice and quick. Okay, number one, what are the best, what is the best off season exercises for off ice sweeping training. Now, this is a great, my first and my first gut instinct is to find something to sweep on in the off ice season. So at least a month or two out from when you're gonna get back on the ice again, I want you sweeping or at least getting in the brushing position because sweeping is one of the least coached, least practiced elements of the game, but it's something that takes your game to the next level. The top teams are putting this much effort in uh, especially in the off ice season when they don't have access to ice. So I thought it's called a hockey slide board here. So they put a little booty on their feet and then they slide from side to side. That's what a slide board is. So I'll link on how to find those on Amazon. Uh, at the same time, you know where they put them. I found these $15 myelin sheets. And I'm intending to glue them to like a piece of wood or a yoga mat, maybe even. Um, for you to sweep on. So it just needs to be something uh, slippery. So I'll let you know how that goes, probably on Instagram or my newsletter if it ends up really good, because this was like 15 or 10 slices uh, for like 15 bucks, which a slide board is going to run. I've seen them for 20 bucks, but you're thinking about a 50 to maybe a hundred dollar purchase, depending where on the world, where in the world you are. So, but the nice thing is with the slide board, is it comes with this little booty, okay? Kind of looks like a hairnet, feels like a hairnet. Maybe you find a hairnet at, not a hairnet, hair protector, you know, the things that people wear to keep their blowout (laughs) when they're in the shower. And you can put that right over your brush head and use that to practice sweeping in the off-ice season. So there's one option. Another option, I have one of them illegal hair heads. I find that this works better. I really like the way that this works. The booty doesn't slide around, okay? And also do this straight onto my like hardwood floor. Okay, I just don't wanna break that obviously. So if you have a piece of hardwood floor, like this is like your fake laminate hardwood floor. And lastly, really, if you just wanna get creative, this is one of those like whiteboard dry erase boards. Put that on something hard. And I, I feel like that's gonna work just as well. So if you've got a hair head, or if you can purchase just the booties online. Um, Yeah, so to answer your question, the best off-ice exercises for sweeping, honestly, dry land sweeping. (laughs) I really highly recommend this at some point. 
Now, if you want to know exercises, obviously things like push-ups, rows, side planks, things like that that are going to stabilize the shoulder, teach you how to transfer energy from your feet through your core to your hands, mimic the movements that our arms do when we're sweeping. Those are really important. Now, I'm going to send you to watch uh, eventually, I think it's May 26th, the level two of my uh, better brushing with better brushing with off ice training workshop. So last year I partnered with World Curling and uh, we put together three workshops. And we the first one, better brushing, and second one was balance and power on the delivery, and the third one was cardio for curling. If you joined last year, we're calling that level one. I gave general information for all three of those pieces, the brushing, the bounds, and the cardio, the heart and lungs. If you joined last year, please still join level two this year because I'm giving all new, more specific exercises that are gonna be diving into things like grip strength, okay, proper rib cage movement, how to access the core, what exercises are we doing to specifically access the core? Um, how are we getting our serratus muscle, that punching muscle that gives us that little extra reach on that down arm, the muscles that help stabilize the shoulder so I don't round forward and get an angry trap or an angry elbow. Um, so all those specific exercises, those are going to be found in the level two. Now, the beautiful thing is level one is and was level one recording is $15 US. Level two is $15 US. So you can access both for only 30 and this year, the Better Brushing with Office Training Workshop is happening May 26th. Uh, I believe it's, what's the uh, 1700 universal time, which is one o'clock Eastern time, so Toronto time. Um, I'm of course gonna link all the information for all of those workshops. Reminder, if you did not do level one, but want to do level two, you can do that. You don't need level one. If you did level one, but also want to do level two, fantastic. You're getting all new information, all new resources. So I'm going to give a little bit of an extra blurb at the end of all of this on uh, the information in there. But to answer the question about what's the best off ice sweeping exercises, literally actually sweeping. <laughs> and then of course, the strength to help master the position and be powerful and build your endurance in those positions. Okay, so next, a friend is worried of long-term damage to the body with the sweeping form. Any advice? First thing that I think of, because that's, again, very general. First thing I think of when it comes to sweeping is there's effectiveness and efficiency. Loads of really top players that you see are all taped up are incredibly effective. They're powerful. They're putting the scratches where it needs to or whatever you believe they're doing to the ice and they're, they're moving really quickly and they're making the rocks do what they need. They're effective, but somewhere in their sweeping is some form of efficiency. They're wasting energy somewhere. They're in a poor position. Hey, I'm talking about my, for example, all my hockey players, see how that drives my shoulder forward? Like no wonder if things like the shoulder, the neck, the elbow, the wrist start to hurt. Okay, same thing with that bottom arm. Okay, when the bottom arm is doing the bending, I can't even do it. Okay, the bottom arm is doing the bending and pushing. I'm trying to give you a good angle. Straighten, see how the elbow straightens and bends the bottom arm. Okay, instead of it coming from the shoulder. Oops, sorry, I kind of wanted this like this. Bottom arm, okay, instead of this stabilizing while the brush head is moving. So see how that's coming from the shoulder versus this. Okay, so there's effective and then there's efficient. So in the perfect world, you're going to both be both effective and efficient. And fun fact, from my experience, what I've seen when I'm working with curlers and on my own quest to be a better brusher, becoming more efficient, making sure that all of your energy, all of your body weight, all of your focus is headed towards one task that actually makes you more effective. So in a sense, those that are really effective, but are kind of cheating in a way like they're compensating for something, they might actually be leaving some effectiveness out the door if they're not efficient. Now, that being said, in the off season, 
Okay. If your goal is like, I feel pain while I'm sweeping in the off season, I'd be tackling that specific injury. What movement options does that area need? Again, if you're the type of person that kind of rounds forward at that shoulder, okay, then we're going to try to tackle that movement. What muscles need to, what areas need to expand, what areas need to stabilize. So tackle it from a rehab perspective, take some time early on. Then looking at the position you need to get into for brushing and the endurance that's needed within that position to move. So it's not just about getting there, but it's actually moving with good energy management. Hey, let me just check my notes. Um, so yeah, effectiveness versus efficiency. Take the time to focus on moving really well, then working on form, okay? And then trying to uh, incorporate that into your dry land brushing. Just like that last question, you can eventually dry land brush off the ice and really practice and video and making sure that you're being not just effective, but efficient. And then in the gym, of course, looking at muscular strength and endurance. So I kind of see this as like, there's a form element here that could be improved to make sure that we're preventing and managing an injury. And then there's work off of the ice in the gym with your rehab movement professional, someone like myself, for example, um, and making sure that you're moving really well so that when we ask you to do those technique uh, pieces, you're gonna be in a really good place. Next question, how can I improve hip pain in my drag leg that I experience? And this person feels it specifically when they're coming up. So this, I'm assuming it's in the front of the hip here. My assumption is they're doing this, and the hip flexor, the muscle that crosses this joint, is primarily tucking them in. Now, there's a couple places we could take this, because I have to actually specifically see how this person is moving. But in one element, I would want to try to get this muscle to help. So not this muscle specifically, but this leg to help. So I've let go of my rock, and I'm pressing through the hands. I'm pressing through this foot so that it's both the muscle pulling and the muscle coming in to take some stress off of that hip flexor, okay? I'm gonna take a wild guess as well that the pelvis is tucked under on that side. So if you're a right-handed curler, that's likely your right leg kicking out of the hat, what can happen is that we get tucked under on the right side, which puts this on a lot of stretch. And then we try to pull ourselves up again, and that's going to really we're taking it from its most lengthened position at the hip flexor and we're putting it in a, in a rough position. So I would work on things that are going to help orient the hip flexor. Okay, so getting into half kneeling positions, make sure we're not dumped forward. Let me show you what I mean by like that. Okay, here's my pelvis. Okay. So pelvis is here. So think of it kind of like a bucket. Okay, we don't want the pelvis dumped forward and the water all dumps forward. We also don't want the pelvis tucked under like this. See how it kind of makes my, my posture go as well versus forward versus back. We want it in a neutral position. So what I have people do is get into this position and think about where your belt buckle goes. We don't want it to be aiming down. We also don't want it to be aiming up to your chin. You want it to aim forward. So finding that middle ground and then doing your hip flexor stretches shifting without, watch my hips, dumping forward. Okay, now that really means we need stability from the backside to allow us to get into a better position with the front. So we can stretch the hip flexor like this with a little bit of a gentle glute squeeze, just enough to keep it on, not gripping and squeezing your butthole like crazy, but just enough that that butt's working while you're doing that hip flexor stretch, okay? Couple other exercises you can look at. He is actually getting into hip extension. Now, just because we've done a bunch with the, the right leg, I'm just going to show it to you on the left. So actually getting into what's called a bear position. Okay, shoulders under your shoulders over your wrist, knees under your hips, and you're far enough away that you can straighten your trail leg behind you on the wall, keeping a little bend in the knee, keeping your hips elevated. So not one hip higher or dropped. And you want to pretend that you're sliding the foot up the wall, but it's stuck. So now we're working on if the foot is stuck to the wall, but pulling upwards, you're going to notice the glute and the hamstring supporting hip extension. So this, that kick part. 
So the back side of the back side of the body muscles are working to support this length here. Okay, so very kind of non-specific question, but hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea and gets your brain thinking what you might specifically do for yourself. All right, I love this next question. Now, obviously, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm not cutting out every time I drink water. <laughs> so I apologize. Got to drink water because I'm talking lots. Okay. So important off-season training for skips. Wasn't a question. I'm assuming they mean, what are some more important things that skips can pay attention to in the off-season? Now, from my perspective, as a movement therapist, as a strength and conditioning coach, there's not a lot different for a primary skip because they're literally their only role. They're probably not playing anything else. Um, for a junior age athlete, honestly, I want that skip to train like everyone else because they may not be skip forever, long career ahead of them. And who knows what kind of shifts might happen in your team throughout the years. So you want to kind of be prepared for everything. So keeping that in mind, skips, you're right, have a little less muscular endurance for sweeping, but they need to be able to access the squat position or the hack position. They need to be able to access the slide position. They need to be able to create power out of the hack and have weight control. They need the ability to sweep six feet. So get into the position, be powerful, be effective, be efficient, okay? And I think a unique piece for them is even though they're standing there and doing a lot more standing, but their brain is going and it's strategizing, it's memorizing, it's keeping pieces organized, plotting six shots ahead, for example, they're using a lot of fuel to, su to support their mental processes, okay? So a skip needs a really big work capacity or the ability to have aerobic endurance. So they need strength training for the delivery, for the takeout, uh, for uh, sweeping power. They need mobility flexibility because they're getting in the same positions. They need in um, endurance because they're throwing lots of rocks, but their work capacity, that ability to do lots of work over a long period of time is really beneficial. So I encourage a lot of skips to do some form of long endurance activity, biking, swimming, walking and hiking, uh, yoga even in its own way. Of course, maybe adding in some intervals because like I said, we're trying to train you just like everyone else, you're prepared. I mean, who knows, maybe you're gonna play doubles or mixed and not skip, right? Um, but they're, aerobic system, your cardiovascular health and fitness, it's your work capacity. It teaches you, especially long running, like that kind of thing, really helps you build resilience, overcome discomfort, really helps you kind of get over that mind hump. If you're like, hey, I kind of was gonna do 8K today, but I think I'll just do six. Like it really helps you push through and put that little extra effort in. Um, and then also it's good for, helping you with focus. Cardiovascular exercise has been linked to good memory, good strategizing, and of course, just makes you an overall happier, healthier human. So that's my answer. Train like every other position. However, your specifics is really working on that mental resilience and focus, which can be done with a lot of endurance activities, still including the strength, still including the power, still including the sweeping, because I think it's still really important, um, but, but really working on maximizing your mind for the game as well. All right, I like this next question. How would you suggest setting goals for the next season when there isn't a specific event you or your team are training for? A lot of what I focused on past few years have been getting to a Sunday and try to qualify for whatever. But this upcoming season, I won't really have those to work towards as much or often for varying reasons. Basically, I guess, what would you suggest as some individual goals to think about in the off season and then work towards in the on season? So when you have a big goal, like qualify for this, win this, those are outcome goals. Now, if I have a team and they're like, oh, I'm gonna win Ontario Provincials, great. You, you can make the goal, but you need a plan. So let's talk about how your performance needs to be. What are some performance goals to get you to a space that when you're in the final, you can take advantage of that. 
Now, to improve your performance, what are the processes that you need to put into place all off season long and all in season? So for me, for this player, what I'm seeing is that you just don't have a big outcome goal. You can still have a performance goal. You can still have process goals. And this is going to become a lot more of a personal journey for you versus trying to get your team somewhere. Now, my hope is maybe instead of competing on weekends and stuff, you're playing in leagues. So I know personally, I've got my competitive stuff, but when I play in leagues, I really want to win that league or get to a certain point in that league. So you could switch your focus to your leagues and trying to improve your performance to do really well in your leagues. Maybe you pick an outcome goal. You want to win that mixed club championships or something. Okay, so pick that outcome goal if you'd like. But also, I think it's really important if you don't have a big outcome goal or it's really not as motivating, like you really don't care what happens in your leagues, I would be doing a performance gap analysis right now. Take video, do a movement assessment, do a fitness assessment. I'll share the free one that I've got that I give out to everybody that's available. It's the link in my Instagram bio. It's uh, part of the off-season menu as well. Uh, but essentially, we're looking at your movement, your fitness, your curling performance. So that's your delivery and your brushing and your overall performance. We're, we're taking all those pieces and identifying opportunities for improvement. So what I would do if you don't have a big outcome goal is identify some things that you really want to focus on. What are some things that you really want to improve next season so that maybe eventually you play competitively again and will eventually work towards that, um, you know, qualifying in Sundays and stuff like that. So I would create those performance goals and then also set some times through the summer that you're going to reassess the fitness and movement. Set some times during the next season that you're going to reassess your delivery and your brushing. So give yourself little deadlines that you're working towards to kind of get you through the season so that you have your own personal performance goals that you have and your own individual processes that you're working towards. All right. Last, uh, last question. I am a club curler and I once overheard a conversation while watching a game at the club. One person asked the other if she thought brand new curlers starting out using stabilizers to deliver are at a disadvantage because they take longer to develop balance because they start leaning on it and never really stop. In contrast, players starting out delivering with a brush must focus on balancing from the beginning. Do you have any thoughts on this? I do, <laughs> of course I do. I, and it really depends, okay? So if you as a player want to use the stabilizer, Use the stabilizer, okay? Especially if you're in leagues, it, like it's really not gonna hurt anyone for you to use a stabilizer. Personally, excuse me, I know that it would be irritating for me to have to make sure it gets down to the proper end and don't forget it in my car and all those things. But if that doesn't bug you and your enjoyment of the game is increased because you feel stable and confident, use the stabilizer all you want. In a sense, yes, the stabilizer can become a crutch okay if you don't know what a stabilizer is it's using something that looks like this while you're throwing okay so you're in your position and i think this person means that people lean on the stabilizer they're they're not even working on balancing they're just using this as a point and the rock is a point so there's a it, there's a couple places where so if that in a general sense if I'm just trying to collect my thoughts, sorry. In a general sense, in that conversation, yes, going directly to a stabilizer can influence if you're able to find balance later on because it actually is easier to lean on compared to holding a brush. However, plenty of people cheat and overuse the brush and instead of using the stabilizer, okay? And plenty of people, I feel like, I have this one person I've been working on who is kind of stuck. They're using the broom, and I actually want to encourage them to use the stabilizer because they go to throw, they don't have balance, so they tuck back because they can't get over this slide leg. They, they can't find balance. Their body can't access that position. It doesn't feel strong in that position. Okay, so they kick out, they slide, and then they drop backwards, and they're really... They're really resilient. They're really working hard. There's lots of stuff that we're going to work on this off season together, but they don't want to go to the stabilizer. They, they, they're, they're convinced that it, they don't want to have to think about taking it to the other end and remembering it all that. Um, but that's kind of 
my thought is that you can struggle with the broom to find balance and using the broom alone will not in all cases improve your balance. So here's why, there's kind of my like second piece on this. If, so I used to run uh, at a golf and country club nearby some kind of team building activities for local companies. So they would come in, they'd have three, two to three hours. They just wanna have team building, with their company, learn how to curl, give it a try, finish with the game, have a good time, okay? In that scenario, I taught with the broom, and then anybody who was really struggling, if we've given them a couple of tips and they're just really not getting it, or they feel really unconfident, I give them the stabilizer, because the goal of that event is for them to have fun. And if giving them the stabilizer gives them confidence, they feel good about themselves, they're not, they get to enjoy the game that we end up playing at the end, I'm a happy, happy camper. If the person then wants to take a learn to curl program, maybe they'll take the time to learn with the broom. But at least they got through that two or three hour kind of crash course of curling. Now, in a six week learn to curl program like my, my club has, I do want people to start with the broom, okay? If you have like doubles, if you wanna travel, it's so much easier to play with the broom, right? So we start with the broom. And on day one, if someone was really struggling, I might kind of give them that stabilizer to get them through the first day. But then we'd be working on their balance with the broom in some sequent sessions. And if they really are struggling, keep that stabilizer. Because if that gives them confidence, wants to join the club, play in leagues, practice, all those things, then we're in a great spot. So here's the other piece to that, is that so as a movement coach and a curling coach, Okay. Think back to my player who really wants to use the brush. We're going to use the off ice season to figure out how to feel strong and balanced on one leg. What muscles, what movement options is this person missing in order to kick out of the hack and actually feel balanced on the leg? They've done two years of curling with the brush and still don't feel confident on it. So you can drill, you can give technique cues, you can have them balance on the backboards, all that kind of stuff. But if they continue to slide and they can't do it with the brush, even with the stabilizer, then we need to actually focus on off ice training. Of course, I'm going to say this, but seriously, there's only so much that balancing, closing your eyes when you're sliding or sliding as far as you can, can actually help you with. Because if your body can't do it, if you don't have the movement capacity, if you don't have the uh, strength and endurance to do that over and over and over again, you actually might start just doing some compensation patterns. So for example, how many people do you know that do this? See how my belt buckle turns to the side? They do this. They could probably slide like this. Okay, they're all twisted. They twist their body, but they're just, they've gone sideways into the leg, the foot overshoots because they actually don't know how to be over that leg. So you can have a lot of compensation patterns pop up because someone didn't take the time to make themselves move well off the ice and they forced using the brush or really trying to balance, et cetera. So this is kind of that whole, as a coach, I'm giving cues, I'm giving drills, I'm giving suggestions, we're practicing, we're trying. They're making a little adjustment, but they're not getting very far. Maybe we test them off the ice. They don't have one good one leg balance. They can't do a single leg squat. Okay. Obviously, not every curler needs to be able to do this at the recreational level. They struggle with things like split squats or step ups. Maybe we need to work on that single leg strength and balance first so that they can actually make the technique adjustments on the ice without extra stress or worry. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, I don't think the stabilizer is the end of the world. If it increases people's enjoyment of the game, they feel confident, they love curling because they feel successful, then I love the stabilizer. If you're on a quest for the brush, you're looking at practicing, doing drills, uh, practicing with the brush, but then also using the off ice season to get a little stronger. Now, again, a little bit of shameless plug, the better, the balance and power in the delivery workshop that I'm doing with the world curling is gonna cover this. So last year, so this year it's gonna be on June 9th, you can catch last year's recording. We talk about general movement for curling. What movements do you, do you need to be able to access? So things like those suitcase deadlifts, of course, the split squats, the step ups, okay? And it was very general, making sure your body was moving properly so you can own that slide position. I wanna take it a step further this year 
So again, you don't need level one, you don't need 2023 version in order to join for 2024, but obviously I not get more information. But this year in 2024, we're gonna tackle specifically getting into a slide position, accessing a good kick, feeling balanced on one leg, okay, and increasing that power out of the back. So specifically what exercises, and again, a lot of this is, will actually be inspired by my work with players who want to improve their balance and their, their power out of the hack in person. Okay, so that's June 9th. And again, I'll give you a quick little rundown of all three at the end of this. Okay, let's see where we are here. Case study. So thank you to those who've put a question in. Okay, case study, as you're reading through this, if you're like, okay, I'd love to be a case study or want to just kind of create a general case study about yourself without any uh, definers so that... Uh, I can help you with your problem, then that's fine too. Like make it up, <laughs> you know, to give names, but it doesn't have to be that specific. Um, okay, let me read this case study for us here. Oh, I put this together. So I've had, it's amazing the number of people that have wanted to have some on ice coaching, even though it's the end of the year, both virtually and in person. Um, so I've had three different coaching sessions with athletes struggling to hit the broom. So accuracy, hitting the line of delivery. And part of the fix was the same cue. So I'm going to invent a case study so that you can see my thought process with this. So this is for people who struggle with accuracy, which is a lot of people. So I'm gonna describe this person as a general curler, right-handed with a couple of years of experience, okay, nice and general. They play twice a week and spare occasionally. They don't get out to practice much, but sometimes we'll throw a few rocks before the game starts and then go in, in the club day bonds fields. They found that they always slide left of the target and they can't figure out how to stop. So on their clockwise, uh, clockwise turn, they're wide. And on their counterclockwise turn, they're inside. They're always left of the broom. This also then, because they're sliding left of the broom, makes them play with how they release the rock and sometimes they turn it in or get it started. So let's pretend this is a live or in-person client that I'm gonna to get to work with. And what I'll do is I'll have them throw about six to eight rocks. I'll view how they throw without worrying about accuracy first. And then we'll do some where you're actually throwing at a broom or at a target and I can actually see where they're kind of losing that line. Is it in their setup? Is it in their pullback? Is it in their push forward? Is it in their release? Okay, what's happening? Is it where they're kicking out of the hack? Um, so I'd have them throw about six to eight rocks, couple each turn, looking at the different spots on the ice. I'll take video because video is really powerful. We can slow it down. I wanna see them from behind, from the side, from the front. And then we'll sit down and, together and look at the videos. So I found this past month, uh, where did I, oh, that's my spot. Oh, I found that many athletes, especially new curlers or people who only play club level, have never actually seen themselves throw. And to be honest, even at the elite level, some people have never had a video of them. I'll be like, oh, like, do you have any film I can look at? And they're like, no. And I'm like, you've curled for 30 years on the circuit. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so I know that, you know, up until a few years ago, that wasn't popular, but people are not filming themselves while they're practicing. I don't know. It's a little scary. You get perceived by people when you're filming yourself, but it can be really good for feedback. So next, we, next what, we ha what happens, we see them move their rock, broom, and slider foot all at the same time, making it hard for them to get over the left hip and their shoulders are turned left, okay? So what I mean by that, if I get down into the hack as a right-handed curler, okay, I get down into the hack as a right-handed curler, I pull up and back, everything's going forward at the same time, which means I'm staying on this hack leg, okay? So I'm sending everything forward, which makes it hard for me to get that foot underneath me without shooting it that way as I'm moving. So instead of it going forward, it's going forward and shooting that way, which can send my tail that way, which can have my body start to drift to the left of the brim. That's one thing that might be happening, okay? What I've noticed with a few people is that, you know what, I need another, I use my uh, golf club stick. What do we got? Four iron. 
We don't use a forearm. Oh, you can't see. Let me show you the camera down a little bit. Okay, what I've happened, what I've noticed is the alignment is in the setup. So I think this is a really cool drill. Give me a second while I move the camera. I think that's gonna be better. Yeah, good. Hard to see on my phone, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty good here. Okay, so the, the golf club is my line of delivery. So I want to eventually, when I'm sliding, get the rock, the slider foot, and my trail leg on the line of delivery. But it's a little more nuanced than that, okay? What I was noticing is as people were sliding out, their broom went out to the side or came behind them. So if between my shoulders stay square to the target, if they don't stay, if they stay together, what can happen is if that broom goes there, look what happens to my body. So my upper body is literally turning, okay? And I'm not actually getting square to the target. It's actually moving my hips. It's actually moving my shoulders. It's making it hard for me to pull that hip back because I'm, everything's already facing that direction, okay? So one of the things I recommend when you're setting up and as you're sliding, so this works most of the time, okay? So imagine if this broom at some point goes that direction. Okay, my rock is sliding ahead of me. There's the line of delivery. So see how that's not quite a 90 degree angle? Let me exaggerate it. Okay, if my shoulders turn that way, if the broom ends up going from here back, see how that takes my shoulders away? And I actually will be, even if I get the rock and the slider, my body will likely drift and I'll probably have to play with it. So when I let go of the rock, when I let go of the rock, what I wanna see is the rock between my hand and the broom. So I let go of the rock. When I look down the line of delivery, it should be on the line of delivery, which is between my hand and the broom. It's part of that follow through piece. If I let go, then my body's drifting, my hands to the left. It's either because my body's drifting or I've turned it in, it started to curl too early, because it really should hang on that line of delivery for at least, let's say, I'm, I'm not good with feet, 10 to 15 feet. It really shouldn't be coming off that line of delivery that early. So what happens is if I keep the shoulders square, okay, see how that when I bring the broom forward, it now creates a 90 degree angle. So that line of delivery and the line between my broom head or my stabilizer, okay, same thing, okay? That space here is perpendicular to the line of delivery and it's bisecting the two pieces because I'm not over here. Right, I'm kind of right behind. I wanna slide along that line of delivery. So what I have people do is practice setting up. Um, I'm usually there putting my broom in front so that I can see that they're perpendicular. And then sliding through cones, setting up some cones or some Kleenex boxes down the line of delivery on either side to make sure that you're sliding through it. Because if your rock gets through it, but your body doesn't, something is being kicked offline and sometimes it can happen through the shoulders. So, one of the other things that I find fascinating about this, and I'll link this in the uh, show notes because I did a whole presentation on it, whole presentation, whole little YouTube on it, was that if my, uh, let me get into the spot here again. Okay, if my shoulders pulled back, okay, it actually makes it harder for me to shift this hip back and actually lean on this hip, get muscles on this hip. It ends up being a very quad, see how the legs kind of turned in, right? And everyone presents a little bit differently, but if that shoulder's back, if we're tightened in the posterior rib cage on the room side, especially the left, it's gonna limit our ability to square a belt buckle. So what happens when I reach forward, okay? Unclench that left shoulder blade from my spine. It allows me to bring this hip back and now I can slide down the line of delivery. So one of the things that I'll do with people is actually get them to do the rock and reach. And you might be like, Steph, we do this every time because it's a great exercise to solve a lot of problems. So we want our hips square. 
and not one hip height. Normally this leg ends up a little higher. Okay, I'll show you what to do if that happens, but keeping the hips level, we wanna turn the belt buckle to the left, pull this hip back and turn the belt buckle to the right. You see how many shoulders are going with it? Okay, now notice if my left arm's forward, helps me get my right hip back. Okay, so we're working on expansion. So if I reach here, if I reach with my left arm and drive my right arm back, I'm gonna breathe into my left back and my right chest. Same thing the opposite side. Okay, so that hip shift exercise, let me show you from behind, from here to here. Okay, you see how that squares my hips up. Now, if you struggle, with keeping your hips level, we're gonna take, let me show you from the front again. So let's say my right hip ends up higher than my left in this example. So my lead leg is higher. If you can't level the hips, you're gonna put a block underneath your trail leg so that you can keep it down and practice moving here. And then slowly this becomes like a little textbook and then we'll be on the floor. Okay, just gonna check my notes for this little case study. So this person was offline, even if they set up properly, when they went to slide, the idea was that their broom turned their shoulders to the left and that pulled their body to the left of their target. So if we can bring the broom forward, square up the hands, square up the shoulders, not necessarily the hands, but the broom and the rock, that allows us to get behind the rock on the line of delivery and allows our kick to be straight forward instead of off to the side, which is also gonna send us left. All right, let me just double check here. Good, so a couple drills for that. Instead of just having them set up, is also to do what I call a snapshot drill. And you can practice this off of the ice with your broom and of course on the ice, but I'm with the ice currently. So I'm gonna get down into the hat. I'm gonna get that broom and rock. This is from Asham. So if anyone really wants to practice, like these little blow ups, it's are great. Okay, so lift your hips. So a snapshot drill, essentially you're pretending the paparazzi are at your practice. So you're not throwing a rock with the intent of it being the exact same speed and tempo. We're gonna pause at multiple different positions. Now I'm gonna walk you through every possible pause. I recommend when you're doing this, the first few times picking one or two places to pause for a few reps, then maybe adding in a third, okay? Because it can be a lot of muscle strength and endurance to really hold this position for a lot, okay? So first spot that we have our photo taken is in the hat. Okay, then we lift the hips, maybe we have a photo taken. Pull back, maybe we have a photo taken. And essentially we're looking to make sure that alignment is the same. Get the rock and broom forward, that could be a photo option. Foot under, that's a photo option. And then of course, the kick. Making sure the broom stayed in, my little pelvis model the way, in the same spot. So off the ice, we can practice it. And on the ice, we can take the time to really hone in the control and tempo. And what I have people do is, let me raise my camera back up again. What I have people do is, two or three sets where they're going really slow and we're working on those couple spots and we're doing what I call like 40% speed. So we're not trying to throw at hundred percent. So like when I say hundred percent, I don't mean hundred percent energy. I mean, the normal speed. So 40%, then you're going to do a couple where you do 60% keeping those pauses. Then you're going to do a couple at 80% and then you're going to do the hundred percent, your normal speed, but keeping those little bits of transition because that can be really helpful for making sure people things get in the right spot and that the body is sent down the right direction. <laughs> All right, perfect timing here. Okay, so thank you for submitting questions. Uh, if you've got a question that you want answered, you can comment on this YouTube video. You can email me, you can Instagram me. You can answer when I at the end of the next month, do a little IG question, looking for questions. Uh, and of course you can use the, the anonymous option as well. If you have a case study that you want me to run through, then please describe your struggle. It can be specific, you can tell me who you are or it can be general, but of course be as specific as possible so I can hopefully help you out. 
If you're willing to give video of you doing that activity, then I promise that I'm super nice. You can go back to the January, what month is this? The February 2024 recap where I had a submission and you can see them very nice, <laughs> okay? So I'm really nice. Uh, I don't want it to be overwhelming. I want it to be like, these are the things you're doing really well. You have this struggle. Here are the things that I'm seeing. Try this. That's what a case study could be like. And of course, if you're inspired and you're like, nah, I kind of just want my own one-on-one, -on -one, then a virtual, or of course in person, but likely virtual coaching session is possible for you. I'll make sure I link that in the show notes, but they're 45 minutes and only $50 Canadian. Okay. So I hope that you'll join me, I've inspired you to join me for the level two workshops that are happening in collaboration with the World Curling Academy. So if you did level one in 2023, then you 100% you are gonna get new information, new exercises, new inspiration from level two this year. So please, if you did level one and you loved it, join us for level two, share it with your friends. If you didn't do level one, you can do level two without level one. You're like, I only have time for three webinar stuff. There's no way I could do more than just do level two. You're gonna get loads of information from it. I might reference a couple things from level one. And if afterwards you're inspired, you can purchase the recording for later, but you won't be missing out on anything. This isn't like a building off of it piece. Um, that being said, of course, I'm a little bit more general in level one than I am in level two. Okay, so May 26th, better brushing with off ice training. June 9th, balance and power in the delivery, and June 23rd, cardio for curling. So we're talking about brushing specific strength and fitness, exercises specific, what muscles are we specifically working on if we really want to master brushing and be both effective and efficient. In balance and power in the delivery, again, a little bit more specific on tackling that struggle to find balance, to find a comfortable delivery position, be accurate, and of course, be powerful. And then the cardio for curling is looking at that. Uh, we're taking it a step further than just nasal breathing and focusing on breathing efficiency. We're, we're really focusing on being able to have a really efficient engine and access working hard and recovering hard as well. So all three of those webinars, you can get the recording and or you can join live. And live is the those dates I listed. And it's 1700, 1700 UTC, which is at one o'clock. Eastern time, so Toronto time. You can register for all of these in a bundle, which is $40 US or individual. You're like, I don't care about cardio. I only care about brushing. Then just do the brushing one. Individually, they're 15 US dollars, okay? Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So I really hope that you're gonna join. Last year was a lot of fun. Um, Last year, I also, in the past three or four years, I was also running a full season training webinar. I'm not running it live anymore. So at this point, I won't be running it live, but you can purchase the full season training recording from last year because I think it was really good. I don't think I need to do it again. <laughs> if you have questions, just send me an email after you've watched it, uh, but you can still access that full season training webinar. So that's where we were talking about full season training, how to train in the off ice season, how to organize your off season training, and then how to manage and maintain your strength and fitness in the competitive season or on ice season. So it's a full, full year look at how to do that. Lastly, I just put out a free fundamental, so training fundamentals webinar. And of course, I'll link it below. You can find it on my YouTube channel. Basically, we're looking at the six things that I think all curling athletes need to be able to master to get the most out of their off-season training. So this is taking it a step further than habit of training, doing something and generally getting fitter. This is taking it a step further than I have specific problems that I want to solve. It's just making sure that you're really mastering things like co-contractions, orientation, breath work, nasal breathing, foot and grip strength, all those kind of things. So that fundamental webinar is free. There is a 55 Canadian dollar uh, program associated with it, which is three separate weeks. That could last you up to six to 10 weeks, depending on how many times you kind of repeat it. But the idea is that you can apply what you now know in some fundamental movements and really make sure that you're moving well heading into your off season or 
if you've never done an off-season training program, it's a great introduction to give you the, the foundation moving forward if you want to get a little bit more specific. So thank you for your time and attention today. Make sure you share this with your friends. Make sure you sign up for the newsletter so that you don't miss out on good, fun things like this. And of course, check out the off-season menu. There's loads of things in there for you if you're looking for more.